Hello again, boxing fans. I'm Michael Montero for Boxing Monthly. You're watching The Neutral Corner for the week of April 9th. All right, first and foremost, I got to thank my man Scotty B in the D for sending the shirts. My man Scotty just went to uh, the Detroit Golden Gloves. And uh, you guys, check out the site, uh, DetroitGoldenGloves.org. Check out what they're doing there in Detroit. Uh, some really, really great things. And uh, my boy Scotty sent back some, uh, some shirts, and uh, including this Kronk shirt. Check it out. Bam. You know I'm all about that. So, you know, thanks so much, Scotty. Guys, we have a very, very uh, packed week in boxing. So let's get into some news and notes. And then we'll get into the, the fight previews and reviews. Okay, real quick. Uh, obviously, you guys know Adrian Broner uh, won against Theo Vane last week. And then he called out Floyd Mayweather. Yo, that just looked like some scripted WWE wrestling shit. I wasn't buying it. Even Mayweather laughing ringside wasn't buying it. This, this supposed beef that they're trying to sell. I really hope we don't see Mayweather Broner next year for Mayweather's 50th fight. Look, I don't want to see any of the people he's probably going to fight. It's probably going to be Broner, it could be Garcia, it could be Pacquiao, depending on what happens this Saturday. More about that in a second. But obviously, uh, we, we talk about Broner's legal troubles. He turned himself in after the fight. Uh, I, I, as far as I know, he's going to post bail. I think he already posted bail at the time I'm filming this. and. Um, he, you know, should go through the legal process. I don't think it's going to do any time or anything like that. At most, it's going to be some kind of probation and community service or whatever. But real quick, news and notes just on a couple of fights that um, are really close to happening, but there's just, you know, some, some things holding them up. So Crawford Postal, I've talked about that one. Terrence Crawford, Victor Postal. Uh, Bob Arum has said, apparently, that Postal and his side have agreed to terms. Crawford and his side have not. So we're just waiting on Terrence Crawford basically to call Bob back to sign the contracts to agree to terms. They're talking about doing that this summer. Uh, here in, in Los Angeles right now is the leading candidate at Staples Center and that's gonna be pay-per-view, but we gotta see, you know, Crawford's gotta step up and sign some contracts here and agree to terms. Same thing with Lomachenko Walters, no new news on that, but look, Walters wants more money. Apparently, he wants three hundred thousand more dollars than what uh, Aram offered. Lomachenko made a very, very public uh, offer to him in in Ukrainian on Twitter and in English on Twitter, saying, "Look, I'll pay you three hundred thousand dollars from my purse if you win." So, looking at that fight, look, man, what, what do you want Lomachenko to do? He's agreed to move up to one hundred thirty pounds for Nicholas Walters. He's the A side in that promotion, especially in terms of international money and international ratings and everything. You guys, a lot of times just think, oh, well, the HBO rating, blah, 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 here in the United States. Look, man, international you know, ratings, international foreign money, foreign TV money, that matters for the promoter. So for Bob Arum, yeah, he's shelling out more money toward Lomachenko than Walters because he's just a bigger name, especially globally. Walters got to step up, man. I don't know what more Lomachenko could do. So two big fights, you know, that Bob Arum and Top Rank are trying to put together. One would be on regular HBO. I don't like Crawford Postal. I don't, I don't love it on uh, pay-per-view, I should say. But uh, I understand why it has to go pay-per-view. But either way, those are two big, big, big fights. Close to happening. Just waiting on a couple of the fighters to step up. But let's get into a quick review of last week's stuff, and then we have a lot of stuff to preview for this Saturday. So I mentioned last week that there were uh, two heavyweight fights going on in Europe and two upset specials. And I tweeted about this because it is kind of interesting. Two Deontay Wilder opponents from last year, which, you know, we all saw as cherry picks. We saw these guys as easy opponents for Wilder, even though he kind of struggled with them a little bit before he ultimately won. Uh, Johan Duopas, Frenchman, and Eric Molina, American fighter, they both went overseas, they traveled to foreign territory, and they scored upset knockouts. For Eric Molina, he knocked out Tomas Adamek in the 10th round in Poland, 
And even though Anamek is shot to shit, he's now lost three of his last four, he was still the heavy, heavy favorite in this fight. In fact, he was up 88 to 83. All three judges had that score at the time of this stoppage. If Adamak could have just got up and fought the last couple rounds, even if he would have lost those last two rounds, he still would have won on the scorecards. But he couldn't get up. Molina knocked him out. And one thing about Adamek, man, he was always known to have a chin. This guy went up against Vitali Klitschko and, and stood up. And, you know, he was obviously wobbled and hurt, but he wasn't knocked out cold against Klitschko. At this stage of his career, if he's getting knocked out by Eric Molina, it's time to hang up the gloves. It's been time for a few years. You know, you look at Tomas Adamek, he won a title at light heavyweight. A lot of people forget about that. And he was struggling to make that weight when he lost by decision to Chad Dawson, who was at that time the premier light heavyweight in the world. And he, I think he dropped Chad Dawson late in that fight, and it was a competitive fight. One-sided in the start, but down the stretch, it got really competitive. But when Adamek moved to cruiserweight, he was the legitimate, the undisputed champion. He was the lineal champ at cruiserweight. And he's just one of those guys, and there's been several of them, in the last 10, 15 years that should have stayed at Cruiserweight. I'm just waiting for one of these guys that wins the lineal championship at Cruiserweight to set a precedent, a precedent there. Stay at Cruiserweight. Collect all the belts. Do what Klitschko did at Heavyweight. Do what Golovkin's trying to do at Middleweight right now. Do that at Cruiserweight and really, really set a precedent. I think a lot of these guys think they're gonna be Evander Holyfield. He was the only guy that they called it, they called cruiserweight light heavyweight or, or no, they called it junior heavyweight, something like that at the time, before they officially changed it to cruiserweight. But Holyfield won the legitimate cruiserweight championship, then moved up to heavyweight. And of course he went on to have a very, very great heavyweight career. Totally different era though, totally different era. The top elite level heavyweights now are 6'5", 6'6", they're athletic, they can move, they have skills, they're technical fighters. It's not the early 90s of the, the, the division that Holyfield was fighting in. You guys forget, man, he was fighting against other small heavyweights like Mike Tyson and such. And yes, I know, he fought Riddick Bo. Bo is a big guy and a very, very good big fighter, but he wasn't... Uh, I, I don't think nearly as athletic as, as guys like Vladimir Klitschko, even Vitaly Klitschko. Uh, guys now like Anthony Joshua, uh, uh, Deontay Wilder, several others, right? So these, these cruiserweights coming up in, in recent years, like Steve Cunningham is another example, they're not going to get it done against the best heavyweights in this new era. Ain't going to happen. So, you know, it would be nice if one of these cruisers would stay there at cruiserweight and really, really set a new, I don't want to say era, but set a, a new lineage there, you know, and, and some sort of history to build upon because no one's done it. But the other fight, Robert Hellanius in Finland was knocked out by Johan Duopas in the sixth round. And apparently, uh, look, Hellanius was the heaviest he's ever been. Uh, he, he had health problems, I think, you know, and he was out, out of the ring for a while. The last couple of years, he's made somewhat of a comeback, but he hasn't looked very good. He's dropped in the fourth and sixth round. And in the sixth round, he was knocked down, uh, I think, just before the bell rang. And he got up at the count of nine after the bell rang. Remember, you can't be saved by the bell. He got up at the count of nine, but he was wobbling around, and the ref just decided to call it off. You look at, uh, I don't know if it's Duapas, Duapas, I'm not exactly sure how you say his, his last name, but his last th three opponents had a combined record of 71-0. and And, you know, he lost in dominant fashion to Deontay Wilder, but he was at least competitive with him. Here's the thing. This fight was for the WBC heavyweight silver title, which is basically a way for the WBC to get a sanctioning fee for an interim, or not even that, for, for a mandatory fight. So the, basically, this is just, Dwapas is the mandatory now for the winner of Wilder Povetkin. And I'm starting to really lean towards Wilder in that fight. They've really made Povetkin wait so long. I think that works to Wilder's benefit. They're playing games the same way they did with uh, Bermain Stavern. 
I think they're going to kind of do the same thing with Povetkin. I'm leaning toward Wilder by decision in that fight, which means we're going to end up getting Wilder Duapas 2 late this year, early, early next year. Oh, well. <laughs> Two big cards this Saturday. Let's start with the one over in the United Kingdom in London in the O2 Arena. Uh, we'll get to the main event in a second, but... Uh, Co-feature, Lee Selby, featherweight titleist, going up against Eric Hunter. Lee Selby is 22-1 with eight knockouts, uh, coming off that, that win, that minor upset win over Gradovich last year where he, he won his title. Eric Hunter, 21-3 with 11 knockouts. He's out of Philadelphia. Two of the fights he's lost, one was a split decision early in his career, really it's a wash, but the other two fights he's lost fairly recently were by disqualification. I think low blows. So this guy has a tendency to get dirty. Wouldn't surprise me if that started to happen here. As far as I know, he's never fought outside the United States. He's taking a quantum leap in opposition. So if things get rough in there, wouldn't surprise me to see uh, Eric Hunter go low or do some dirty stuff and get disqualified in yet another fight. If that doesn't happen, this is going 12 rounds for sure because neither guy hits with a lot of power. But obviously, you got to favor Lee Selby here. Class will show. And, and you got to favor him big time by wide unanimous decision. Matthew Macklin and George Groves fight on the undercard. So for the folks there in the O2 Arena, and this is a sellout crowd. This sold out almost instantly as soon as tickets went live. Uh, those two guys, you know, they're, they're local favorites in that part of the world, and a lot of fans will be excited to see them fight. But main event, United States uh, heavyweight Charles Martin, 23-0, 21 knockouts. I think he has one draw. Um, six foot five, 80 inch reach. Has uh, usually comes in in the 240s range. That's where he's been coming in. Um, high 240s in recent fights. It'd be better if he was in the low 240s in this fight. Anthony Joshua, 15-0, 15 knockouts, 6'6", six 82-inch six, reach. He also has been coming in the 240s. But when you see these two guys, you see a big difference in the frame, right? Joshua is built like a Greek god. He has the, the body of, you know, like a, a fitness model or something. And uh, Martin's a little soft in the midsection. So Martin actually has a nice jab. He has some tools and he has a comfort and uh, just a very relaxed feel in the ring, you know? And I think that's gonna serve him well in the early rounds of this fight. He's coming in with a lot of confidence. But if I'm Anthony Joshua, I'm going to the body and I'm making Martin work. Martin's gonna wanna stay on the outside and jab and make this a technical fight, a slow fight, a boring fight. His best chance is to do that and to take Anthony Joshua late into a fight because he hasn't been late into a fight yet. For Joshua, it's about activity and it's about volume. If you can get to the body, go to the body, but he's got to be careful of Martin timing him and coming over the top, you know, if he dips, if Joshua dips down to the body. But I think just Joshua applying pressure, you know, staying behind a high guard, right, and being smart. Because he got caught early, in, early in that fight against Dillian White. Can't get caught against Martin. Martin's a better fighter than White. Hits harder, just a better athlete than White is. So he can't afford to get hurt like that early in this fight. He's got to stay really, really smart, apply intelligent pressure, make Martin move his feet, make him work, and start to wear him down. And then I think he could chop him down in the middle rounds and score a knockout. I'm not gonna make an official prediction until I see the weigh-in. With heavyweights, a lot of times you could just see by the weigh-in. If Charles Martin shows up weighing 250 plus pounds, he's just going for the payday. If he shows up weighing 240, 242 pounds, he's taking this shit seriously and he's really trying to win. So we'll know more when these guys weigh in. But as it stands, just knowing what we know about the two of them, I see maybe a late rounds stoppage for Joshua. And there's part of me that wouldn't be surprised if this fight went all 12 rounds. I know that sounds crazy, but it could turn into a more technical type of fight if Martin establishes that early 
and it could go all 12 and it might leave some experts on Twitter saying stuff like, oh, Joshua is a hype job or Martin's a hype job if he wins it. I don't think Martin's going to win by decision though. If Martin wins, he's got to knock Joshua out. But I think it'll be interesting to see, again, not making any official prediction until the weigh-in. So let's wait on that. But the big card, top to bottom, is in Las Vegas here in the United States, obviously. Manny Pacquiao going up against Timothy Bradley for the third time. Technically, this is a rubber match, even though everybody on planet Earth knows Pacquiao won the first fight. But this is a very, very even matchup. And the, the word going around is that a lot of the big money in Vegas, a lot of the whales are putting money down on Bradley. You know, I've seen some of the footage of Pacquiao training in camp, and he always looks good. Pacquiao's a great athlete. He always looks good while he's training. But he just, that fire. That fire in his belly, that fire in his eyes that he had 2007, 2008, 2009, it's gone. He's just been going through the motions. Compare training footage of him for this fight compared to when he was training for Ricky Hatton. Just look at the difference in body language and, and the, the ferocity with which he was training. It's very, very different. I think Bradley's the hungrier fighter. And I'm leaning toward him by split decision, possibly controversial uh, decision win this Saturday. I made a prediction video about it, so check it out. I did a Montero's Monday Minute on that fight, so be sure to check it out. But the real good stuff is the undercard here. On the televised undercard, Arthur Abraham going up against Gilberto Ramirez. I've talked about Ramirez on my channel a few times. I've covered a few of his fights. He's 33 and 0, 24 years old, 6 foot 2 super middleweight, 75 inch reach. Uh, he's already had two fights in Las Vegas. He's been fighting outside of Mexico. He's a Mexican guy. He's been fighting outside of Mexico for the last two or three years. So he's become acclimated to fighting outside of his, his home country. He's even fought in China once. So I think he's ready for this moment. He's going up against the veteran Arthur Abraham who holds a title. I personally think it's a paper title, but he holds a title. Uh, look, for Abraham, 36 years old, 5'9", he's going to be the much shorter fighter, 72-inch reach. I've just never been big on Arthur Abraham. And I, I get in arguments all the time uh, on Twitter and stuff with some of you Arthur Abraham fans. It's not that Abraham is a bad fighter. He's a fine quality fighter, but he's just not elite in my opinion and never has been. You know, you go back to the Super 6, all three of his fights that were outside of Germany, he lost. And he lost them in dominant fashion. I was ringside for his fight with Andre Ward at, at the StubHub Center. And that was my last Andre Ward fight ringside. Whew, I had enough right then and there. But he completely dominated Abraham. Durrell was completely outboxing Abraham until he got dirty and landed that, that vicious, uh, nasty, nasty foul punch that really just altered Darrell's career. And then uh, Carl Frotch handled him very, very easily. So Ramirez obviously is taking a quantum leap in opposition against Abraham, but I really, really think he should take this one. Top rank paid out a little extra money to ensure that this fight was going to be in the United States. Obviously, they believe in Ramirez. They they're making a big investment in him. They didn't want this fight over in Germany because they didn't feel that they would get a fair shake on the cards. Abraham has won some close controversial decisions. So um, here's the thing. On paper, a lot of people are expecting this to be a great fight. I just had this feeling it's not going to be. I had this feeling there's going to be exciting moments, but it's going to kind of turn into a technical fight and Ramirez is going to win a workmanlike decision. Arthur Abraham covers up because he's always in this shell and he doesn't throw many punches. When he's in this shell, when he does throw shots, there's not a lot of leverage on him. He doesn't punch with proper leverage, right? It's all, it's all up here and this, this kind of stuff. He scores, but there's not a lot of power behind him, especially at super middleweight. And I just think Ramirez is going to outwork him, out hustle him, win a decision. The fight I'm most excited about is Oscar Valdez against Evgeny Gradovich at featherweight. Oscar Valdez, 18-0, 16 knockouts. I've covered a few of his fights. 
I've seen this guy ringside. Um, I remember he was on the Bradley Vargas undercard last year, and he was shaky. I think it was in a co-feature. He was shaky in that fight. I think he got dropped early. But in his last couple fights, he's shown improvement. He's grown from that experience. I think it made him a better fighter, and he's ready for this challenge. Uh, he, like I mentioned, he has 16 knockouts in 18 fights. Gradovich is 21-1-1 with nine knockouts. Gradovich is very aggressive, throws a lot of punches, very tough guy. You can't hurt him. You're not going to knock him out, but he only has nine knockouts himself. Because of that style matchup, okay, I just think this is going to steal the show. I think this is the fight that's going to be the best one on a televised portion of the card. Gradovich is 2-0 since his loss to Selby last year. And, um, you know, he's hungry to get another title opportunity. I just think Valdez is going to have too much. And Valdez could possibly stop him to the body. But I think this one is, is going the distance. I like Valdez in a decision. The other, the opening fight on the pay-per-view card, Jose Carlos Ramirez, 16-0. 12 knockouts, 5'10", 72-inch reach, 23-year-old, 140-pounder, going up against the veteran Manuel Perez, who is 25'11-1", with only six knockouts, a smaller guy at 5'7", 67-inch reach. He's 31 years old. But don't let that record fool you. He's fought anywhere from featherweight to welterweight. And he's fought several, several former titles. He's fought guys like Brandon Rios, Victor Ortiz. He's lost those fights, but he's fought some very experienced guys. And for Ramirez, he was a 2012 Olympian from the United States. He's from California. He's another one of these great prospects top rank has signed. Both Golden Boy and Top Rank have signed some quality prospects and are matching them the right way. This is a great step-up fight for Ramirez. I like him by decision in this one. I think this one will have action because Perez, the veteran, like I said, he's been there, done that. He's been in there with some tough, tough guys. He always brings it. He always, always brings these. Not there just to collect a paycheck. So this should be an entertaining fight. On the untelevised undercard, you have 2012 Ukraine Olympian bronze medalist Alexander Grovjik, 9-0, light heavyweight. He's fighting. You have uh, Russian Konstantin Pomomarov, who's 29-0, uh, welterweight. And the, the mean machine, one of the baddest young guys coming up. He's like Gennady Golovkin crossed with Sergei Kovalev, seriously, so far. This Lithuanian fighter, two-time Olympian for uh, Lithuania. I'm going to destroy his name. Egidridis Kavalishkis, 12-0, welterweight. Look this guy up on YouTube. I know you probably don't know how to spell his name because of the way I just pronounced it. Look him up. Look him up on YouTube and, and watch some of this guy's stuff. Mean motherfucker. A couple of 17-year-olds also on the card. A German, Leon Bauer, who's 7-0, super middleweight, and an American uh, super featherweight, 3-0, Devin Haney. So a couple of 17-year-olds top rank signed. Look, all those prospects I named on the untelevised portion of this card, all undefeated. All new guys with top rank. So uh, this is really a stack card top to bottom. And that shows just how much Bob Arum and the folks at top rank knew this was a tough sell, right? Nobody was asking for Pacquiao Bradley 3. But if you have the money... I recommend buying this card because top to bottom, it's, it's going to be very, very entertaining. And if one of the televised undercard fights ends in a sudden knockout or something, no doubt they're going to show some highlights from the untelevised undercard. Another hint, another thing I would recommend, go to Top Rank's website. A lot of times they stream the untelevised portion of their undercards. Not sure if they're doing that this time around. Always good thing to check though. If you can catch a stream somewhere out there, find something online, a stream of those untelevised fights, several of these prospects are going to be key guys in their divisions over the next couple of years. Worth checking out. But that's it for this week, guys. Um, let me know what you think. Comment below, like, share, subscribe. I'll see you as ringside.